Hi, Gary Bunnell here. This, um, this video is going to be a little different. I am, I'm responding to a lot of, of questions and a lot of statements, uh, not necessarily questions, and, and it's all about predicting the future. So in a duality cycle, it is really much easier to predict the future, to, to look ahead to the immutable events that collective consciousness has consensual agreement to. In the unity cycle, it's much different. Um, as unity begins to overtake us, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds really set the tone for the future. So, yes, there will be immutable events along a timeline, and a single word could change an immutable event. A, a single under, a understanding of the potential outcomes of an event. So, predicting in a, in a, <laughs> in a unity cycle is much more difficult. And um, I feel badly when I make a prediction and it causes people concern about the future and about uh, what will befall humanity. Back in the middle 90s, uh, actually 96, 97, I was talking about a future event in the United States where uh, New York City and Washington would be bombed on the same day from the air. And uh, I, I personally thought this has to be kind of an impossibility uh, because of our defense systems. And what, what I was seeing uh, really kind of was like surrealistic. And when I asked for a date, all I was getting was our emergency call number, 911. And so in lectures in the United States and in Japan, I, people would say, what about the future? And I would offer this scenario up and say, I can't get a date. I can only, you know, I only, it's an emergency. So I get the emergency numbers. So I never thought to equate 911 with a date. So um, my wife and I were sitting in the kitchen <clears throat> and sure enough, on the news, suddenly it was showing planes going into the World Trade Center and then followed by news of Pennsylvania and D.C. The plane in Pennsylvania was heading for the White House. It was taken down by uh, people on the plane, uh, passengers, basically. So uh, uh, I also, in that, and I shared this only once uh, in, a, in a past lecture, I saw Saudi Arabia as the perpetrators. Um, and I didn't quite know how to uh, bring that totally into alignment because we were, at that time, trying to find ways to work with uh, closer with Saudi Arabia. So, anyway... I've predicted a few things for the future. Uh, 33 years from now, I've predicted a reset for life on Earth. Um, in 2037, I've predict predicted a CME event that will um, really cause a lot of problems for all of our major cities um, because of the response our electrical grid has to these big CMEs. Uh, it shuts it down. Uh, I think in 89 and 2003, we had kind of a, a preview of some minor events. So uh, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to show a couple of images here. And when people say, what does a, what does a uh, reset mean? Okay. Um, life comes back very quickly on Earth. Not all life is destroyed. Um, it's, there's a reset, and a reset doesn't mean total destruction. 
it means that the way of life on earth is going to dramatically shift in a single event. Now, the last time this kind of thing happened was quite a long time ago. At one point in North America, there was this very large inland sea, and we, the area of that we think of as uh, portions of Arizona, Utah, portions of western Colorado, uh, some areas all the way up into Canada, actually. Um, and that sea had a lot of different um, islands in it that we now recognize as mountain ranges. And uh, the Earth was struck by a large plasma release from the sun. Thankfully, uh, it was a glancing blow. It created what we think of as the Grand Canyon. Now, uh, <laughs> geologists will say, well, the Grand Canyon was created by, you know, constant water etching out the land. Well, the water did uh, uh, resurface the canyon for sure, but the canyon was created by a plasma strike. The inland sea actually was what created it to look as though it had been washed out by water. There was a huge release of water that went down into uh, what we now think of as um, the Baja Peninsula and out into the Pacific Ocean. So the Colorado River now flows through the Grand Canyon. Um, that event was a glancing blow to Earth. There was also a larger glancing blow on Mars, a near identical scar there. There was a planet orbiting Jupiter that was had a direct hit, and because of, of the technology on that planet, and yes, there was a civilization there for a long time um, of beings from different uh, systems, and what happened was they uh, were storing some highly volatile uh, materials in their atmosphere uh, for a lack of a better place to store that. It would be like if we took our nuclear waste and put it in, in barrels up, <laughs> up in orbit. Um, when the, the direct hit of plasma hit Maldek, the planet, because of all of that uh, in its atmosphere, the planet exploded. It's now part of the uh, asteroid field between Mars and Jupiter. Now, Mars's two moons were a part of Maldek. Prior to that, um, Maldek did not, or Mars did not have moons. Now, at that time in our solar system, there was an orbiting observation um, vehicle, a transmigration vehicle for another term, that orbited Jupiter and was really kind of monitoring life on Mars and life on Maldek. And when Maldek exploded, it, in combination with uh, the large glancing blow um, that created the large marineris uh, on Mars, um, all of the life on Mars almost was instantly destroyed because of that glancing blow and because of Maldek's explosion. As a matter of fact, Maldek's explosion, when it reached us, it pushed our atmosphere toward the Earth um, the outer atmosphere was right down at the surface, and because of that, there were a lot of instantaneous uh, freezing of plants and animals. And now as our um, glaciers are melting, uh, they're finding uh, things that were instantly frozen. Um, but it also did something else. We at that time had two moons and they were much smaller, and uh, the moon closest to us had a, a slower orbit than the one further out. And the uh, percussion wave coming from the explosion of Maldek blew those 
uh, uh, moons out of our orbit. And of course that destabilized the atmosphere on Earth. And the wonderful thing was, if we could say there's something good out of this, the observation platform that had been orbiting Jupiter was on the back side away from Mars and Maldek when this happened. So it was not uh, affected. Uh, Jupiter took a big impact from the explosion of Maldek. Um, then um, that observation platform was moved into orbit around Earth to stabilize the atmosphere of Earth. Because at that point, of course, Earth was in the Goldilocks zone and, in, and even becoming more so in the Goldilocks zone because the sun was was uh, reducing its overall uh, temperature. And um, uh, that observation platform is our moon. And there's a reason why the moon doesn't make any sense in its size, in its orbit, in its composition. Um, why, why, in fact, are all of the craters of the small ones and the large ones always the same depth on, on the moon? Um, why is the rock on the surface of the moon uh, much older than the rock further down? Uh, there are so many weird things about the moon that literally uh, science can't explain in all of its theories about how we got the moon. But the, the point I'm making here is that this reset that's coming in, in 2057, in 33 years, this reset is going to be much like what happened when the Grand Canyon was created. Uh, there was a lot of instantaneous um, uh, flooding of lands because uh, ice sheets, ice caps, all melted very quickly during that. And uh, basically, um, uh, life as, as was known to the humans on, that, on the planet at that time was profoundly altered, to say the least. Um, after that, there were a lot of underground dwellings that were created all over the globe. Um, the more famous ones are in Turkey, there are some in China, there are some in, in uh, Peru and in uh, the Brazilian uh, forests, the jungles. So uh, when we look at this reset that's coming, um, I won't be here. I do have descendants. They will be here. Um, you know, the, the only thing humanity can do is prepare itself for these CMA, CMEs and these large uh, plasma releases. Um, you know, I, I feel, uh, you know, all of the, the sorrow that's going to be on Earth at that time for not just humans, but all animal uh, forms, all plant forms. Um, there's, it's going to be um, uh, uh, quite an event, a reset. Uh, the uh, 2037 event is going to disrupt our technologies. And um, I think in 89, the Russians uh, even thought that somehow the US was creating problems for their satellites because the satellites um, were taken offline because of that CME that happened then. You know, of course, there's the famous Carrington event in the 1800s. But the, the point of all this is, Yes, timing is really difficult in the Akasha uh, because time is, is not recorded in the way we experience it. Um, on the planet right now, there are several different ways of recording time. And when, when we really, really understand that we're in a volatile uh, solar system, that that stuff happens here that you really can harm the very precious life that's on the planet. When we understand that we need to be prepared for that, we need to harden our technologies against CMEs, 
we need to do those things that are going to help different life forms survive in the future. Um, we have to wake up. We, we have to gain this, this great vision that's available to us through the opening of our third eye, through the releasing of conflict within us, through dropping judgment, through observing, through looking beyond um, um, the propaganda. And I want to use that word because the religions and science have over the years done so much to keep humanity back. Uh, because they want to somehow protect their opinions and their ideologies. Um, we can't afford that now. We are, we've reached a turning point, 2001, 2011. That 10 year period shifted us into this unity cycle. Every 13,000 years, events begin to happen on earth and humanity has to deal with it. The human herd in past has gotten down to 32,000 individuals. Uh, we share, most of us, almost complete identical DNA um, because of those events that takes humanity down to very small numbers and then as it grows back. Um, in 1920, there were 2 billion people on Earth. Uh, in the years between 20 and 2000, six, or 20, 2020, sorry, six billion people were added. There are souls here that want to witness and observe this process that we're going through, how our human spirits uh, evolve uh, as a result of that, how we awaken prior to these events. And the way to do that, of course, is for an eternal soul to be in collaboration with a, with a, a body and a spirit. And so uh, the crowd has gathered. It's like um, two hours before a concert, you know, there are a lot of empty seats. And then as the concert time arrives, uh, everything is filled up. Uh, hordes show up. And that's basically what's going on here is we, quite frankly, are here to observe this shift. It's, it's important, it's important beyond words that we shift our conscious awareness into a very di different dimensional reality so that as many of us as possible can become thought-based beings. As many of us as possible can um, go through enlightenment and illumination to ascension, uh, taking us back to pure energy so that once the reset is over, we can begin the process of bringing human life back on earth. So um, thanks for listening to this. I know it's, it's not one of those videos that I like doing, but um, I think it's important I've been reminded recently that some of my predictions were wrong in the past. Totally own that. Um, and I think it's so important that people know we are at this point uh, in Earth's journey. So uh, please take care. Uh, I, I'm sorry if this causes worry. Um, it, it's simply meant as an alert uh, you know, instead of being afraid, be prepared. So thank you so much. I uh, hope, to, hope to get another video out soon. Thanks. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.